All right. Again, worst case, they all just have the same. Yeah. Yeah, that way people don't answer questions. Okay. Like I'll gather around the mic. That's kind of yeah. like the better call. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right, welcome everyone um, to the McLean Lecture Series. Um, I, my name is Julie Euler. I am in general internal medicine and the chair of the Department of Medicine Women's Committee, which led me to this role in the ethics department running the um, seminar series on gender equity and ethics. And um, we've had a great seminar series so far. Um, we have a few extra of these if you'd like. We are um, we finished our fall and winter um, lectures and um, we're in the middle of our spring series. So obviously today I'm looking forward to introducing some of our surgery colleagues. Um, next week followed by um, Dr. Chor, who's one of our own um, ob uh, faculty talking on gender equity and family planning. Um, followed by the next week, Dr. Um, Valerie Montgomery Rice, who's the president and CEO of Morehouse School of Medicine, talking on gender equity and ethics at Morehouse School of Medicine, um, followed by a number of other lectures. So please um, feel free to join us on Wednesdays um, at noon for the upcoming lecture series. Um, but without uh, any further ado, I'd like to introduce my surgical colleagues um, who I've been working closely with as they have um, started their own um, Women's Committee in the Department of Surgeries. <laughs> um, but first, let me start with um, Dr. Sarah Ferris, followed by Dr. Wallace and Dr. Donington. So Dr. Ferris is an Associate Professor of Urology at the University of Chicago, where her practice focuses on male and female voiding dysfunction and reconstructive urology. She completed her undergraduate at Princeton University, her medical degree from the University of Michigan, followed by urology residency at Vanderbilt, um, and a GURS fellowship at the University of Iowa. Her current leadership roles include the urology uh, residency program director, founder and president of the Interdepartmental Women's, Sur uh, Women's Surgeons Committee, prior ambulatory medical director for urology, and the current surgical director of the DCAM operating room. Her research interests include an ongoing RCT looking at the role of antibiotics in prosthetics, urologic trauma, and reconstructive surgery outcomes. She's a senior editor for the AUA core curriculum. So welcome, Dr. Ferris. Next, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Donington, who will be joining us here on the panel um, here. She's a professor of surgery and the chief of the section of thoracic surgery at the University of Chicago. She obtained her bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan and her medical degree from Rush. She completed surgical training at Georgetown University, cardiothoracic training at the Mayo Clinic, and a surgical oncology fellowship in the surgical branch of the NCI. She was on faculty at Stanford and NYU prior to accepting her current position um, in 2018. Her current clinical interest is in the diagnosis and surgical treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. She has expertise in the use of multimodality therapy for locally advanced lung cancer, clinical trials in lung cancer, and treatment options for the medically high-risk patients with lung cancer. She's a past president of the New York Society for Thoracic Surgery and the Women in Thoracic Surgery. She's a surgical chair for the thoracic section of NRG Oncology. So welcome, Dr. Donington. And then um, finally, Dr. Wallace is going to be joining She's us. Coming. Yep. She... Coming yes. <laughs> so she, I'll just introduce her now so yeah. we know, but she's an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery and rehabilitation medicine who specializes in joint care. Dr. Wallace treats a wide range of common and uh, complex hip and knee conditions, performing surgical procedures such as minimally invasive knee and hip replacements to restore mobility and reduce joint pain. She has experience in managing cases of arthritis, osteonecrosis, AVN, um, post-traumatic arthritis, and hip dysplasia, and she helps patients who have damaged and painful joints to improve their quality of life. Um, in addition to providing comprehensive joint care, Dr. Wallace is an active researcher committed to investigating the newest treatment and surgical te techniques for patients with joint pain and arthritis. She's uh, been published in notable peer-reviewed journals like the Journal for Arthroplasty, Ortho and Trauma, and the Journal for Women's Health. So please welcome me and uh, please uh, join me in welcoming our surgical colleagues. We're looking forward to hearing about the state of women in surgery. I think we're good afternoon now. I think we hit it. So good afternoon. Got it. Is that better? Good? Okay. 
Um, I'm, we're here today to talk about the state of current state of women in surgery. So I'm going to go through and touch on a few topics and then ask the panel questions um, just to give you an idea of some of the literature that's out there currently. Um, no relevant financial disclosures. And I have to give a very special thanks to Dr. Mary and Henry who um, shared some of these slides with me and helped provide some valuable data on this. So it's very interesting. Um, I'm in the overview, I'm gonna run through kind of the main topics is uh, background and then topics specifically about building um, a clinical practice, compensation, work-life balance, research academics and leadership, and then how, how can people help? I really like this quote, are we standing, is it a glass ceiling that women are hitting or is it a foundation of sand? And I think this really hits at a lot of the biases that happen and hinder progression of women in surgery. So the quote is, when women are in the hiring or promotion process, they are judged on their social skills while men typically are not. Thus likability becomes a key attribute and um, for women who want to get ahead in their careers, but likability does not drive the outcomes sought by academic institutions, journals, school superintendents, college boards, or corporate search committees. So part of the implicit bias that we as a society hold, valuing niceness in women and toughness in men, suggests that women aren't limited by a glass ceiling, but perhaps by a foundation of sand. Women can't find their footing within the attributes they bring to professions without seeming to act out of sync with these external um, expectations. So currently practicing women, we have about 21% of general surgery, ENTs about 12, urology is 11, and neurosurgery is eight, orthopedics six and five. So those are the current practicing numbers. You can look at our residency programs and it's, abs like it's definitely increasing. So general surgery, 40% of women going into general surgery are women. ENT is 35%, urology is 28%, neurosurgery almost 20, same with orthopedics and cardiothoracic. So we're seeing doubling of numbers right across the board. And it's gonna be really important to support women as they move forward. This is from the um, orthopedic literature, um, but basically you can see as things have moved up or as people get younger, the prevalence of women surgeons is rising. And it's just gonna keep going as people are getting older, as we see more people going in. Um, one of the, sorry, Sarah's a little late. She's gonna talk about this. But one of the things that was really interesting is what persuades or dissuades residents from going, they asked female residents, what persuades you or dissuades you from going into a surgical subspecialty? And positive influences on women who choose um, our personal attributes was a big, piece of it. Um, and dissuaders are more like experience and exposure and work-life considerations. So building a practice. Women have good outcomes as surgeons. So this was a comparative post-op outcomes um, for patients treated by male and female surgeons. It was a population-based study. Um, they matched patients between male surgeons and female surgeons, patients based by age, sex, comorbidity, surgeon volume, surgeon age, and then hospital um, to the same operation performed. And they found that out of 100,000 patients, fewer patients treated by female surgeons were likely to have a mortality. And that overall, they had similar surgical outcomes, including late of stay, complications, and readmission. Many people are probably familiar with this study that was out of JAMA. It was a Medicare study that looked at one and a half hospitalizations by uh, treating physician gender among hospitalists. They found that patients treated by female physicians had a lower 30-day mortality and lower 30-day readmission rate. So women have good outcomes, essentially, is what we're finding. Um, prior studies have showed that female doctors are more likely to adhere to uh, clinical guidelines and evidence-based practice. Um, this was, so despite having good outcomes, this was a nice study. It actually looked at 40 million referrals um, in Ontario to male surgeons versus female surgeons. And essentially what they found is that male surgeons were more likely to be referred to. They received 87% of the referrals. Um, and female surgeons were also less likely to receive proceduralist or surgical referral specifically. Um, this disparity did not narrow over time as more women entered surgery. And this was another one that was um, an academic center direct referrals. And again, female surgeons were found with equal 
training and seniority um, to receive fewer new patient referrals, so about five and a half per month. And this reflects clinical practice. So this was looking at pediatric surgeons and the female surgeons had a lower case volume, quite substantially actually, it was almost 60 per year um, and had lower shares of specialist cases, which would result in less focused practices. Um, that from our standpoint is less practice to gain experience, right? And also it makes it harder to build a specialty practice. This was a really um, interesting study where they looked at what happens to women after they've had a bad outcome. So specifically, they were looking at referrals from primary care doctors after mortality. And essentially, interestingly, what it shows is that women, referrals to women decreased, whereas for men, they actually increased after a bad outcome. So some of the questions that I wanted to ask the panel is, do you think that gender has affected your clinical volumes and referrals? And I, Dr. Donington's our one here right now. So we're working on getting your mic. You just need that one. Uh, we're gonna need another one. It would, one yeah, we can share. So I do feel, I mean, first, I, I guess I don't want to apologize or say that somehow appropriately the Women's Surgeon Committee is led by women who live within the dregs of surgery. <laughs> you saw us, we were on the bottom, 11%, 6%, 5%. So we really are, we're not, we're not gynecology, we're not breast surgery. We, we live in the hardest realm. And so, yes, do I, have I seen that throughout my practice where male colleagues who are fine surgeons seem to be able to build big practices effortlessly. Yes, I've definitely seen that. Have I seen male surgeons who I thought maybe were not as good a surgeon build and maintain a strong practice based on I don't know what, but it definitely happens. So I do think, but then again, I come from a field, especially I think in cardiothoracic surgery, we are really hindered by cardiology and what cardiology looks like. Because again, very male dominated, especially when you get into the interventional realm of that, where so many referrals uh, from our field come from. So we get kind of done in by, by all those things. And I, I feel like I've had a similar experience where it's just been more of a struggle to build surgical cases. Now, I admittedly, I'm in probably the most challenging area in urology. I do male reconstructive urology. So some of that is also maybe patient preference as well. And, and it's always a bit more of a hurdle to gain their trust, especially in clinics where they're asking like, are you going to be the surgeon or just even like, um, I don't know if I'm comfortable talking to you. And so I have to overcome that hurdle as well to be like, I talk about this all day, every day, give me a shot. And usually it's all good by the end of the appointment, but there's definitely differences um, and it makes it just that much harder. Women are more likely to get non-surgical referrals. So for me, like I get a lot of recurrent urinary tract infections or pain syndromes or other things like that rather than the cases per se. So it just, it, it's harder to build that practice. Um, what have you done to try to help overcome those barriers? It's a good question. You, I mean, I think it's the same thing that every other surgeon does. You go out of your way to talk to your referrals, to be good, to respond, to be very communicative and things like that. I will, I always say that I do think most of, there is a portion of my professional success, which is based upon the fact that I'm nice and yet non-challenging to my male colleagues. I go out and play golf with them and I never win. It's great. They love it. Um, <laughs> so I can talk their language, but not be threatening. And I think that's unfortunate that I've had to find that role, but I think many successful female surgeons do find that role. I think it gets back to that initial thing where it's, and I'm going to bring up some of the biases later, but it's having that niceness, right? Where you have to just make an extra effort almost to be pleasant and nice because it's expected and the role you have to play in the extra communication. I've definitely found for me, since I've had, um, I get try to get cell phone numbers because then I can ping people and this is what's happening. This is how your patient's doing. And it's kind of a reminder to them too, that you're here, that you're doing things, which has been helpful. Um, and then I, this is specifically for you because you're a chief, a section chief, but what would you kind of do to help overcome the barriers for say you or other female physicians in your group? 
I, I don't have the right answer to that. I mean, we try to set a very level playing field um, and all those things. I try to go out with, you know, out into the community with my women uh, the same way I do with my uh, male faculty to always be going out. I, it's more about just equal opportunity um, and talking everyone up on the same level of this is my great junior faculty, not my great male or female junior faculty. Yeah. Um, so compensation. Uh, so looking at the sociological research, experiments have shown that women who push hard on pay negotiations are actually penalized more than men who do the same thing. Um, perceptions of niceness and demandingness explain the resistance to female negotiators. So this has actually been proven within the sociological literature. Um, and this can make a big difference. So the, everyone's quoted this. I finally found the study. 5,000 dollars at the start of your career can make a million dollars difference over a lifetime of earnings. And that's because most raises are going to be percentile based as they go forward. And a person who's willing to ask for a raise at the beginning may be willing to ask and push a little bit more as their career goes on. Um, the largest pay gap um, has been found in women with advanced degrees. And you can see top 15 major occupation with largest gender weight gaps. Again, um, Physicians and surgeons is in here. So to give you some money numbers, which are a little terrifying as a woman, general surgery, $83,000 difference per year. Medscape general surgeon compensation report, urology, double AMC data, on average, women make 50 to 60,000 less per year. Um, there's a really nice study done of the AUA urology, sorry, membership. And they adjusted for work hours, call frequency, age, practice setting, fellowship training, APP employment. They try to control for everything. They found adjusted salary $76,000 less. So hitting around that $80,000 less. Um, this is thoracic surgery. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about the data specifically, but it was uh, we're also- exactly the same. And I, I will tell you, it's I fall entirely into the stereotype. It is painful for me to ask for more money for myself. And yet I can, if, if Matthews hears me complain one more time about not paying my children well, and he's like, they're not your children, they're your faculty. I go, but you got to pay them. You got to pay them now. You got to pay them more. Um, I, it's so easy to argue for them. And it's really hard to argue for myself. And it's it's bad. You listen, you look at that stuff and you, I get angry. So there is this study that came out, I think it was around last year, and they simulated a 40-year career for women. And they found that female surgeons over a 40 career, two and a half million dollars less over their career, which is you can imagine is a substantial amount of money um, for them. And that adjusted for hours work, clinical re revenue, practice type and specialty. Um, so some possible explanations, right? Why are we seeing this $80,000 pay gap per year, essentially? Are we going into subspecialties that pay a little less, like breast surgery in general pays less than, or the RVU compensation is less. Female urology is the same way. A lot of these subspecialty areas have le are less remunerative. Um, there's a question of whether or not women are more likely to take on uncompensated jobs, such as education or committee work. Um, they may pass up promotions. They're, they are, and I'm gonna get into this later, more gonna be more limited geographically or the threat to move, which is also a reason people can get pay raises. Women are more likely to be married to full-time working partners. So it limits, it limits their ability to um, move to a different place if needed. Um, differences in negotiation we touched on and some unexplained variants. Um, you touched on this, but do you think gender has affected your compensation? You've been at a few different institutions. Uh, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. I look at my last institution. It was quite bad. It was one of the reasons I left. Um, it was a problem. And, you know, the men are much more willing to go in every year and ask for more money. Um, I, I think they are. And they're more willing to say, we're going to leave. And they look at you and they like know where your husband works. And they're like, you're not going anywhere. Um, I think we all need to do a better job around family leave also, as I watch my junior faculty go out for family leave and I watch all their metrics go red. There's just no reason in 2023, we can't pre-schedule that they, if they're doing great for eight months and it goes to zero, that they don't still stay green because that has to get in the way. Yeah. And women are still more likely to take family leave than men. Um, I think all those things definitely contribute. Yeah, um, I um, 
I am very lucky. My husband is kind of talks, we talk about like the sociological data and some of the business data. And he was, I've learned about these. And so going in, I'm like, I'm just going to push myself to ask. And as much as it's uncomfortable, I've kind of, I know the data. So I force myself to ask pretty much every year. Um, and I think it helps, but it's, it's challenging, right? That balance. And it's a little uncomfortable to have to do that. Um, I think it's important also to know, especially since we're in an academic institution for both the the chair, the chief, and for the faculty to know what that double AMC data is. Know what the numbers are. Know what the range is for you. Um, that data is pretty specific. It gets down to where you live, what you do, kind of how busy you are, where you are in your timeline, and you should have an idea if I'm falling in or not falling in. Uh, so, and I think arming yourself with that data makes that difficult discussion mm -hmm. so much easier. Um, and really gives you, it makes it a stronger argument. I think keeping things objective, that's where that data is helpful to be like, oh my goodness, like I'm really low on that percentile and my numbers, my RVUs, I'm really producing. So I think having that objectivity is, makes it easier and it makes it an easier argument as well. Um, it also makes it easier to leave when you realize you're not hitting it. <laughs> that too. Um, what do you do to try to limit gender bias as a section chief? I mean, I think, I don't know, it's a good question. I always wonder if I'm too biased the other way in favor of my female faculty. Um, you try and just put everything on the table very evenly. You try to look at everyone's pluses and minuses. You try, I think we all have gender biases. Um, I think as a woman you, in surgery, you're much more sensitive to them and therefore you try uh, very hard to put them away. I think, I don't think we could ever get enough bias training whether that be gender, race, religion, whatever, we always need to be, keep reminding ourselves that it exists, it exists in my head, I need to come to the meeting prepared to, to be able to put that away. Yeah. Um, so work-life balance, of course, a big question mark. I don't think balance actually exists. It's more like a teeter-totter. Um, I really thought some of this information was interesting because it gets back to some of the biases. So Anne-Marie Slaughter, if you haven't read a book, it's a really great book called Unfinished Business. Um, she had the article that came out. It's one of the most popular articles. Um, it was in the Atlantic and it was called Why Women Still Can't Have It All. Um, and this is a follow-up book. But some of this um, information was 40% of American women are now primary breadwinners, which I was floored. That's a huge number. Um, of women being primary breadwinners for their family across the board in America. Mothers spend truffle, still spend roughly twice as much as fathers on childcare. So they, breadwinners still having to work hard at home. And in 2013, women were earning 82 cents to a man's dollar. Now I think this is fascinating, but single women without children made 96 cents to a man's dollar versus married mothers made 76 cent, cents. So there is, seems to be this like motherhood tax is what I would like to call it. Um, and this holds out. So this is really interesting. This is physicians who have NAHK awards. Um, and they found that women were more likely to have full-time employee partners, 86% versus 45%. So twice as likely to have full-time employee partner at home. Um, women with children spend eight and a half more hours per week on domestic activities. So I will personally say I maybe have an hour of night at night to myself, maybe if I'm lucky. Oh, it's glorious. But that, if that's, if you think about it, that's gone. That's every hour, that hour, one night a week, that hour, every night a week I get is got eaten up by those eight and a half hours. And the women were basically, if there were disruptions in the usual childcare, women were four times more likely to be the one to have to step back from work to cover that child than their partners. Um, this was one looking at career satisfaction based on if you're a physician mother and many women reported sole responsibility for most domestic tasks. And I thought since we're talking about surgery, physician mothers and procedural specialties had higher levels of domestic with higher levels of domestic responsibility was associated with career dissatisfaction. So this this extra work at home is associated with career dissatisfaction. And this is proven within the um, AUA, the American Urologic Association. So they surveyed men and women about work-life balance. 37% of women were dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. And 50% of women said, no, they did not have enough time for personal and or family life. I think this was a, a thoracic surgery data as well. Right, so this is work that we did within 
uh, cardiothoracic surgery. One good thing about having only 350 women who are cardiothoracic surgeons ever in the U.S. is you know all of them and you get to ask them questions and they all respond. So we have response rates high in the 70 percent on our surveys. But this looked at um, the, looked at the concept of who does what at home. So if you look at most domestic care, uh, chores related to maintaining the house and child care, women said they were primarily mine. Um, men tended to do more things related to automobiles and I think finances, and that was kind of about it. But it really goes to that whole concept of the more you had to do at home, the less satisfaction there was on the job. And it's a little bit of Sheryl Sandberg leaning in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have kids, you get to lean a lot harder than those who have, you know, two or three small children at home. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this was very uh, informative work. And I think it's one of the places we have to really do a lot more work. Um, yeah, I, I, as much as I live somewhere in between because I don't have children, so that takes a lot of it away, I, I think I'd be way more productive at work if I had a wife. Yes. Um, so, and then kind of getting into some of the sexual harassment and also um, burnout, if you will. This was a survey among surgeons and 58% of women surgeons reported sexual harassment in either verbal or physical um, conduct or unwanted sexual advancements. And this looked at our trainees looking at discrimination, abuse and harassment during surgery training. So 65% um, of women reported gender discrimination. 66% reported any discrimination on the basis of gender, race or pregnancy and childcare. 20% reported sexual harassment, which is kind of an alarming number when you think about it, to have 20% of trainees reporting sexual harassment. 15% um, reported it up to a few times a year, and 70% reported any mistreatment exposure. Um, I really like this, it broke it down, where is this happening? So for women, and this is getting into like the systemic biases, where does it come from? For women, 50% of the time is patient or patient's family or nurses or staff. Right, so it's not just who we're, it's like our patients, our, their families, the staff around us. Thought that was really powerful data. And then um, verbal or emotional abuse, uh, it's typically from the attendings is what they reported. Um, again, sexual harassment, 31% for women is from patient or patient's family. So it's a very high number or else attendings, which again is a little alarming. And then 43% reported pregnancy or childcare discrimination from attendings and 23% actually from their co-residents. Now this is some, I wanna post this interesting. Now the verbal or emotional abuse was actually equal between men and women um, residents reporting it from the attending. So they're both about 50%. And really interestingly, men reported sexual harassment from nurses or staff, 22%, which I just thought was interesting, kind of fits into some of the stereotypes we've had. And then pregnancy and discrimination, the male men reported the same number of discrimination from their co-residents as well. So it gets back into that, maybe not motherhood tax, a little bit of parenthood tax in general. Um, I'm not even gonna touch on this because this is a huge topic that's very important and definitely affects women and burnout as well, but it gets into perceptions of pregnancy and motherhood as a trainee or as a surgeon, and also the infertility and pregnancy complications. I mean, this is a massive separate issue, which deserves its own talk. But basically we're looking at things like harassment, difficulties establishing legitimacy, going into this unfavorable work environment, the challenges in motherhood, right? Insufficient support, work-life balance, negative perceptions of working mothers that we see as an actual financial tax. It's a male dominated culture. Dr. Dianton was just talking about playing golf with them, feeling you have to fit in and put yourself into that male culture. And then societal pressure, those, we talked about patients, nurses, families, right? It's not just our colleagues, it's also within and all around us, kind of those pressures to hit stereotypes and higher expectations. So not surprisingly, what do we see? Emotional exhaustion. So for women, you can see if they're single or divorced here, if they're married, it goes up higher, right? Because there's, you kind of your caretaker for your husband, I think a lot of the time. Again, the same, and for men actually, it goes down roughly if they're in a committed relationship or married. And the same thing for women, if they have children, it's not protective against emotional exhaustive, where for men, actually it is protective, which is really, I, I'm not sure exactly where that comes from, but I think that's really interesting information. 
So um, Sarah, thank you for joining us. <laughs> um, how do you feel, or do you feel like work-life balance do you have in your life? Um, how do you achieve this? I think, you know, pro probably nobody has exactly the right balance, uh, men or women, but um, I think it's just important to recognize that it's constantly something that needs to be reevaluated. So what might work for me this month might not work for me in three months. And that means that my entire family is constantly trying to rework and rearrange schedules and make sure that we have the proper support to make it work. Um, and it, it's not coming just from my side, but from my husband's side and from all the caretakers that are involved in our family. I think it it's a constant uh, reworking of the system that that's working for you or not working for you. Um, I don't do have any divide up household. Labor? I don't have any specific tips on that. Um, I think uh, rather than actually dividing up labor in our household, it's just the recognition that everybody's busy and everybody, you know, needs to chip in. And uh, one thing is not necessarily my job or my husband's job or my kid's job. Uh, but again, we just constantly need to be all recognizing what's out there and, and what needs to be done. I think one thing that's worked for us is making lists in our house. So if everybody sees what's on the list to do, you know, everybody can chip in to try to get those tasks done on a daily basis. And that's what we do every single day. You know, I might wake up an hour before everybody else, but I'll start a list and leave it in the kitchen. And then my husband might add to the list or do something off the list and our nanny helps as well. So um, I think just transparency and communication can be really helpful in that sense. I call it a team sport in our house, getting everything done. It's just a team sport and- Absolutely. Yeah. And I think late in life, I recognize that there's nothing you can't pay to have someone else do. Uh, I guess the older you get, you have a, a little more uh, income to play with, but I learned early that I was never going to be good at cleaning or at laundry and that all of that could be done by somebody else. Yeah. One of my, my uh, friends across town in Northwestern always says delegate. So she's always delegating every single little thing to somebody else, which is a great tip, I think. And not easy to do always. So it's super easy. Just like <laughs> <laughs> not easy for me. I should clarify. Um, so, but I think I'm going to say one thing about being yeah. a chief here. I try to actually help my faculty do this too that recognize that there are times that you can lean in and that times you will not be able to lean in and to try and plan that way and i don't and i don't i mean everyone should know when they're going on maternity leave and that you know you're not going to do stuff but recognize that there's stuff that we have to do now this deadline is now because you're going to be busy and mm -hmm. this is going to happen and and that's going to happen as your kids grow and as your family changes but recognizing those periods where you, where you can encourage your faculty to lean in when you can because you're going to have to step back and, and to try and plan that way, I think is really important. I love that. That was something that Anne Marie Slaughter's book talked about because that's what happened to her. She was really high level, one of the first international policy advisors for Hillary Clinton when she was secretary of state as a woman. And so she was trying to commute between Princeton and um, the White House basically. And one of her kids was struggling and she had to step back and one of her points is like, there are times you can lean in and there are times when you can't. And so allowing yourself kind of that ability and having someone hopefully above you who appreciates that, that there's times when you're gonna be able to be more full force and, and that's life and that's what happens and that's okay. Um, so this is a big one, um, research leadership and academics. So I'm pulling from our urology literature but basically like this study found when it comes to publications, um, female authorship has an upward trend. Um, and interesting, women were, were more likely to publish actual research articles as opposed to things like case reports, or review articles, or editorials. Um, interestingly, they're less likely to get cited though, which I thought was really fascinating. And I don't, you know, it's just names on a paper. So I don't know where that bias would come from, but I thought that was interesting. And then our AUA plenary panel, so 91% of those have a male moderator and 64% are male only panelists. So lots of, again, granted my society, it's like 10% women. So the numbers, it's not entirely surprising, but I think people are trying to make an effort. Um, on the editorial boards, we have in general surgery, about 15% are editors, um, associate editors or um, board members, but only 5% are women of editor and chiefs. And now this is, I love this. 
in urology, uh, the major journals, there has never been a female chief editor of any single one of them. And since 2020, we've gone from like four on the editorial board up to 20. So it's only gone, it's only doubled in 20 years. So this is where I start to think about a glass ceiling effect, because this is like getting women, how do you get people into leadership? It's like elevating them and getting women on to, how do you get promoted? You know, you need to be publishing. You have to be cited. It's index factor, right? You need to be on editorial boards, society leadership, no change in gender to society presidents from 2012 to 2021. It stayed the same. Um, this is the R01 grant. So uh, orthopedics, zero women when this study came out had an R01 grant, zero women. Um, if you were in surgery, you're going to get about 45,000 less. If you're in urology, you're looking at almost 80 to $90,000 less if you even do get the grant. Um, so what happens? Be it's all these little things add up, right? So promotions typically are based on research academics being, you know, nationally known, right? If you're lower numbers and it's harder to break through that, you're going to see less women in leadership, right? That's what we're promoted on. Same thing here, we go from assistant professors, 25% women, 3% women chairpersons. Urology is the same way, this is leadership. Again, 3%. Um, Cardiothoracic surgery, I didn't know if you wanted to touch on the numbers there too. Uh, this was uh, work we did with a similar kind of uh, going through the all, it's easy to do all of us and looking at where we lie. Um, we have a subspecialty issue in cardiothoracic surgery because we have three subspecialties, general thoracic, adult cardiac, and congenital. Um, there were no, when the survey went out, there were no female congenital heart surgeons who had made it to professor in the country. You're kidding. No, there still isn't. We had one who almost made it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very sad. Um, and in, in our field, cardi uh, thoracic is actually, um, very well populated by women, and that's where the most uh, professors lie. I believe the professors are the dark blue uh, tied there. Within uh, adult cardiac, it's still quite small. Um, it's just, it's a, it's amazing. But again, this all gets to, if you're not being promoted, there's pay inequity, um, and it's difficult to make it to leadership, most definitely. Um, so some questions. Um, what have you done to advance your career? Um, so some of it is perseverance. You just keep going. Just keep your head down and you go. You found a job you like. You found a surgery you like, even if you're not well represented. Um, you just keep pushing. I think my society, my specialty is at a point where it really wants to change. Um, so I, I actually feel like I found myself at the right place at the right time. Um, but it, 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 is a, it is very much, uh, I think, for those of us at the the cracking of the glass, it, it's a lot of work to crack the glass. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the hope is that we've made it easier for those uh, who follow us, uh, most definitely, and that you open the doors for others and you set up pathways that make more sense. Sarah, do you feel like as an assistant professor, you've encountered obstacles along these lines? Uh, maybe not yet, but I'm assuming that's coming. Um, you know, I, I think things that I'm doing now to try to advance my career in the next few years are things like um, maintaining relationships with folks at the uh, national level. You know, um, my professional association is the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, which is a far, far minority women. Um, but there's a group of us that are are well connected and, um, you know, try to promote one another within the association. And um, I think it's working. So I think just maintaining that sort of relationship, um, doing my service at the hospital level, you know, being as involved as I can at the hospital level. Um, those are sorts of things that I'm doing now. I think it's, again, really hard to kind of hit all the marks that are going to matter for a promotion. You know, the there's always things that are going to fall to the wayside when my time in the day runs short. And I don't think that's specific to women, but um, I think it's it's challenging. 
Yeah, we, my, as I mentioned, my GERS group is very male dominated. Um, but recently I have one of, I have a woman who I'm close friends with. We went to medical school together and she's worked with a couple others and there's that we're doing like a women in GERS and this to start maybe doing research together and to try to help promote, how can we help promote one another? Because it's just so incredibly male dominated to try to tip the balance a little bit and maybe get women more speaking and that kind of thing and have some of the senior women help some of the juniors who at least know their names and find out who they are so you can recommend them. I, I think those groups are incredibly helpful for any uh, underrepresented minority. Um, the Women in Thoracic Surgeon is a group that has been around actually for almost 40 years. And it is amazing the amount of work they have been able to do because they got together, they got organized, um, those surveys that go out to every single woman, mm -hmm. every single one gets one. If you're alive and you're a cardiothoracic surgeon, we know how to find you. Um, but uh, it can't. It does so much for advocacy. It does so much for support, and it has really done so much to bring up those junior numbers. I think in the current class, almost one third of uh, trainees going into cardiothoracic surgery this year were women wow from I mean there were six in my class out of everybody there were six so to say that you know we're up to a third that's just that uh, says a lot about what a group like that can do in terms of research advocacy support all those things are really really important and then I was wondering what advice would you if, if someone was interested in going into surgery like what advice would you give women to look for that their institution's doing to try to support their careers? I mean, I think you want to look at the institution and look at the departments and see, you know, who's in them, mm. you know, and I think it, you, there, I've been at three now and you can see institutions where diversity matters and where diversity doesn't matter. It's, it's not, it's not a secret and it's not hard to see. Um, and there are many really good institutions in this country where diversity is not a priority. And if, you're going to go that way it's going to, you're going to be challenged and i think you just have to have go in with eyes wide open um that that things may be more challenging there but i think i i don't think these things are hard to recognize i really don't um so I wanted to touch a little bit. I've, I feel like I've kind of hounded on the bad, if you will, like where are the barriers? Where are we seeing problems? What is this? So I'm getting into a little bit about what can you do to help? Um, I've talked about the, the women surgeons often violate gender schemas and we have implicit bias against us. There's significant disparities in salaries up to 80,000 a year. There's disparities in patient referrals. We have work-life balance issues, right? And it's especially tricky for women where there's more at home, which can you can't replenish yourself, right? That's your time and it's gone. And so you're gonna have higher burnout. Um, women are often more dissatisfied in residency. Uh, there's higher rates of emotional exhaustion and burnout, higher rates of harassment and discrimination, and women aren't advancing at the same level. Um, I, I love this. It was a little entertaining because it hits exactly at what Dr. Dyington was saying. So they surveyed special subspecial urologists and the male urologists perceived that the practice culture towards women as more equitable than their female colleagues across all uh, categories, equal access, work-life balance, freedom from gender bias, leadership support, right? So it's a little about the blinders. And I love this quote, studies suggest, the study suggests that there are gender-based differences in how gender inequities are perceived and experienced in urology. Acknowledgement of these differences is the first step in identifying opportunities for improvement. So I just showed you a whole bunch of data. I don't think anyone would disagree with me that these biases actually do exist. And so this is where we move through. How do we start to help? Um, it starts with awareness. So recognizing that it actually exists um, and then getting you have to be motivated to help, to start giving yourself some self-efficacy and positive outcome expectations and then the action piece of it, right? So that's moving through how we help people. I think this is another piece of it. And I wanted to touch on this when it comes especially to leadership. Um, 
men apply for a job when they meet 60% of the qualifications, but women will often will only apply if they meet 100%. This is, I finally found this study where this came from because people quote this all the time. It was from a Hewlett Packard internal report and they actually looked at the nuances in this. So it's not a confidence issue. It's, I love this. Rather, it was a belief that women thought the required qualifications are actually required when the hiring process, when it's really one where advocacy relationships or creative approach to framing one's expertise could overcome not having those expectations. My husband always likes to say, he's like, it's a wish list. Those job requirements, that's a wish list. That's what they wish they could get. If you have most of them, you have the right background. This is what I would encourage women to think and also people sponsoring them. And you know, you can figure it out and you have the resource, you ask for the resources to help you figure out the other areas. You can apply, it goes like men. I mean, it's just, it, it's this belief that you have to have all the requirements, which is kind of crazy. I mean, you are gonna learn on a job. If you already met all those requirements, you should already be doing the job and then looking at doing the next step. Um, and this gets into mentors versus sponsors. So mentors are really important, especially early in the career. They give you advice. Um, I think having a mentorship program, which we're working on establishing here, is really important to help you advise with advice and figuring out your career. But sponsors are different. And sponsors, I think, are really the key and kind of a rare golden egg. They're the people who help you get to the next level. They're the ones who are going to advocate for your promotion. They're going to work in the back, right? Make connections to senior lead leaders and promote your visibility. Um, this is up from the Harvard Business Review about the real benefit of finding a sponsor. Um, this is what they call breaking through the last glass ceiling. So it's when holding women back is a surprising absence of advocacy for men and women in positions of power. Women who are qualified to lead simply don't have the powerful backing necessary to inspire, propel, and I think this is really interesting, protect themselves on the journey through upper management. It does take someone, if you make a little mistake, to have someone who is your back and protects you. Women lack in a word, sponsorship. So women are 50% less likely to have a sponsor, and they, in these studies, underestimate the pivotal role it plays in their advancement. Women feel that getting ahead based on who you know is an unfair tactic and that hard work alone will get them rewards and recognition. But the reality is sponsorship is a normal part of career advancement. And it really takes people, I mean, I put the golf course one I love. Can you share the story of you were talking about the golf course where the decisions were all being made at this golf game at the meeting and not at the table? Well, yeah, okay. So, uh, well, one thing I want to say about sponsorship is you don't get to go get a sponsor. A sponsor right. finds you. And you often don't know who your sponsors are. You don't know who put your name in for that position. But somebody did. Um, and, yeah, I, I do think that's where women lack. We have plenty of mentors. We don't have sponsors. We don't have people who are willing to put their neck out by putting our name in. Um, but I recently got put into a nice, uh, on, the, on the American Board of Thoracic Surgery, someone sponsored me, someone put me up, and I got on, only I realized that we would like come to the table for all these votes, but someone already had the conversation. The conversation happened on the golf course when we went to the spa, the three of us, the three women on the board went to the spa, the 12 guys went and played golf, and they'd already made the decision. And it was really upsetting. <laughs> So I got my clubs out and I started taking my lessons again. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to spa next year. I'm going to go play golf. I know how to play. This is why I learned. But I think it was so, to me, you told me a story and I was reading this and I was thinking about it because I think that goes to show like so much happens behind the scenes, including those sponsors. Like, hey, you're out golfing and like, oh, I've got this great young colleague and whatever those informal conversations are that are happening. And it's not even like they're deciding on, what they're gonna make, but the conversation comes up and then they're, it's in a social casual environment. And I think one of the problems is like, I don't, I mean, I'm an athlete, but I don't play golf. It just was not my thing. You really don't want me to play golf. It's not pretty. So if I'm not there in those typical arenas, um, I'm not gonna be able to be in the room where it happens, where the discussion's happening. And so I would encourage, like this gets into people who are leaders have your discussions and conversations in place that are gender neutral or like not where, where everyone can be there. And so everyone has, is able to provide input because the reality is, is women 
and people of minorities have different experiences, different perspectives that are incredibly important and are really going to drive institutions forward. And if you leave them out of the conversation, you're really, you're in, uh, institution or your group is going to suffer. Right. And I, I have to say, in defense of the guys who went to play golf, they're all really good people. And we were having conversations in the spa. It's just that when you're still a minority and your group doesn't represent that bigger group, yeah, the way of those conversations is very different. Um, and it's it's hard. And, and we all, when we sit on committees and workforces and do these things, we want to be, we all want to have a good time and, and trust the people we work with. It's just we have to recognize where other people get left out. Yeah. yeah. So individual individual interventions, what can you do? Um, I would say look for opportunities to acknowledge women's comp uh, sorry, contributions to amplification. So one thing that happens to women is they're sitting around the table and they may suggest something and then someone else will say it later and they're like, oh, great idea, Larry. Um, when really it was someone else at the table who said it. So I think it's important if someone says something to be like, Jessica, that was a really great point. I just wanna amplify what she said. So it really helps to bring their thoughts and opinions to the table. This is definitely something that happens. Um, recognize and acknowledge microaggressions and comments or assumptions based on gender schemas. And that can be people around you and also within yourself. Um, I love this. Before you say something to a woman, think of how it would say to a man. And my, I was reviewing this with my slides with my husband. He's like, thanks, honey. And it's true. Or like, thanks, doll. Or, oh, that's like sweetheart or whatever it is. If you said that to a man, like it just doesn't, you're know, like, thanks, honey. It's not going to sound good. Or another great one is like, oh, do you really need that raise? Like your husband works at home or your husband works. Is anyone going to say that to a man? Like, oh, do you really need that raise? Your wife works. Like that's, it, if you think about how it sounds and how the, your gut reaction is just different. So if you can, if you, something comes out and you pause or you think about something, think about how it sounds if you said it to a man. Um, actively encourage women to apply for leadership and promotion, I would say, and sponsor them through the process. So if there are women who you think are stars, promote them, sponsor them, talk about how great they are because they need an extra boost. Um, I said this, help your wife at home and be a role model. So I think for men, especially walk the walk, you know, if you show that you're doing these things and you talk about doing these things, it normalizes it and people below you are going to see it. Residents are going to see the example that you're leading. Hey, I'm, if you say out loud, I'm leaving work to go pick up my kids, right? It helps to normalize that behavior and makes it acceptable. I think that's really important to be role models for the next generation. Um, and this gets to what Dr. Dianton was saying about having just admit we all have bias, both men and, and I will say men have bias against them too. So there's really good data showing, especially in business, that men are significantly penalized for taking paternity leave like huge penalties for it because if they're not the manly man, they, they get like, they won't get the promotions either. So there's bias both ways. And um, one of the books I read recently said that the next women's revolution is really a man's revolution. And that's what it is. It's allowing men to help at home. It's allowing men to be more involved in childcare. And it includes any of this data, but there's some good studies like the Harvard business school show that men now are like 20% more likely to be want, wanting to be involved in childcare. And so gender, like this norms and the schemas and desires are changing. And I think it's important to support both ways. Um, institutional interventions, I think giving women surgeons extra assistance with outreach and equal di considering equal diagnosis distribution within the call center and new patient referrals um, to help with the building the practice. I think transparent objective constant compensation plans and keeping this in mind as you're going through and making sure you don't have that bias as you, women are not gonna be as comfortable asking for a raise, just period, end of story. So you, it takes a little helping hand, I think, for that. Work-life balance and burnout. Um, I think implicit bias training is important. This institution's doing a really nice job with that. Um, supportive leave and with RVU and call adjustments and lactation policies really support, supports through. I think that gets into exactly what you talked about salary. Your RVUs look terrible during your <laughs> the year you have a kid, so you don't get that raise. And then every raise after that, you've missed out on a percentage raise. So it literally, your salary just 
it will never get as high because of those limitations. And I think equal parental leave helps because men will, it'll, you know, their RBUs will go down too. So you have some of that will balance out, but just keep that in mind. I think things personally that would help are on site daycare options. Um, and then we have good backup care assistance, which is good. And then more of like a systemic level, um, explicit, explicit, purposeful and fair distribution of uncompensated teaching and service load, workload. Just because you have a woman on, in your team who will say yes and how is interested in more of these things, it does not mean that it should be just her doing it. So some of these things, if there's workload that is unpaid, doesn't get RBU, whatever it is, it should be equally distributed between men and women in the group so that women aren't being penalized by taking up more of that. Um, we talked about equal leave policies and tenure clock extensions. I think, um, and we have a brief bit of this, but objective measures of success and milestones for promotion that are defined ahead of time so everyone knows the rules. And Dr. Dyington really led this, and I have some of the slides from their promotions committee, which really makes it objective. And when I presented this information at our Society for Women Urology, they loved it. People were a lot of like chairs for other departments across the hospital, really excited by our promotions, how it was laid out and really were interested and wanted that information to take back to their institutions. Um, some other things, I think improve flexibility around part-time and times in need. It gets back to what Dr. Donington was saying. Sometimes you can lean in, sometimes you can't. Sometimes a family member gets sick, sometimes you get sick and allowing adjustment for that um, when there's times of need is important. And then it gets into blind, I showed you the NIH grant awards are lower, um, publishing's lower, people in editorial journals, all that. So blinded manuscript grant hiring and promotion practices. And then I think um, gender and diversity goals for society meetings representation is good. There's um, Mary Cuse with ophthalmology was talking about how there's almost some oversight where they suggested people for the panels and they looked at me like, we want it to be more, maybe look for another woman. So it's not the same person doing the same thing every time. So having some people on a higher level kind of looking and evaluating um, and having goals is good. So I wanted to touch briefly on what has been happening here at University of Chicago. Um, to me, retention is really important. And on a big picture level, it costs over a million dollars for an institution to replace a surgeon, possibly more depending on their level, a million dollars. And you think about if you can retain one doctor, what that million of million dollars can pay for to support them. And I think getting into um, clinical productivity, as I talked about this matern like motherhood bias, People think that people are gonna be less productive when they come back, but they're not. So this was a study that looked at um, clinical productivity after maternity leave and maternity leave, any other type of leave, it bounces right back. People are right back working. I mean, these women are hard workers. So our um, institution, and thanks to Julie, big shout out to Julie for helping me with putting this all together a couple of years ago, um, was supportive of an interdepartmental women's surgeons to, committee with the goals of trying to help women and retain them. It's funded because I think it's a little bit of put your money where your mouth is. So if you believe this is important, the departments do fund it. Um, the chair is compensated and we have subcommittees. Um, one's advocacy. And so we've been working with our department of surgery. Um, it's almost it's in the final bit, but they're based on the data, they're going to prorate RVUs for those four months around parental leave because you go down by 50% going in, takes 50% of a month, you know, to ramp back up. So they're working on adjusting that so the numbers don't look so bad and also doing a 0.05 FTE reduction to support lactation because it does take time away from clinical activity um, during that year when you're, um, if you choose to sorry, I'm like lactate, lactation to pump basically. Um, we also have approved a new department of surgery, uh, resident lactation support. And as Dr. Dyington mentioned, the transparency was important to us around the salaries and productivity. So we're able to send out the AAMC comp, um, comp data and RVU data for their subspecialty. So they're just able to take a look at that. We also are doing um, professional development for faculty and residents and have new newsletter, letter, website, and social media to promote what women are doing. Um, Dr. Henry has been huge for the nominations committee and has just been incredible. And we've actually had a number of women win um, local and national awards just because they're 
being nominated. So if you're not nominated, you're not in the running. And so having this to promote women is huge. It's important for promotion. We're hoping to do some research based on these changes to see if it helps. The med student committee trying to encourage women to go into surgery and give them practical good advice. Um, they've been, we have mentors, suturing workshop, panel events to try to support women and encourage them to go into surgery and then a membership committee. So this is um, Julie's research which was she for she and it just, they did this with their women's uh, medicine and medicine committee. And just by prom, um, nominating women, the percentage of female awardees increased from 26, uh, like about 30% up to almost 60% and almost double just by nominating. And that was across all award types, educational, clinical and research. Um, the Department of Surgery DEI group, I think it's been very progressive what they've done. And so they've come up with a new um, promotion criteria. Um, Jessica, do you want to talk to about it or do you want me to run through just you quickly? Can through. I mean, we basically put together a promotions committee, which was an outside eye between uh, section chiefs are still responsible for promotions, but to be an outside set of eyes and resources for the junior faculty. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, we all knew what the rules were of engagement because it's such an opaque process from below and so clear from above how it all works. Um, and we want to make sure that it was equitable cost services and genders and everything else. And it has really been quite, I think, useful. It's only in its second year now. Um, but uh, I think it's it's uh, provided some place for junior faculty to come with questions and for guidance. Uh, and then I think we have a yearly discussion with the chiefs, which we've had one so far one round of those. And I think they were really insightful uh, to learn what each chief is looking for and to try and get a very organized approach. Uh, but yes, yeah, uh, 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 check this on the next couple slides. I think the mm -hmm. junior faculty really like having the the list, the list of like, these are the basic kind of things you should be doing. And like I said, some of it seems so obvious when you're above and some of it was is so not obvious from below, but it has really helped, I think, um, not change the criteria, but drive conversations in the right direction. And I think it's really nice as a, like, even for me, I look at this and I'm like, what am I checking? What boxes, where do I still have deficits as I'm going through? And it's just like you said, I don't know, Sarah, if you have any thoughts, but like, I had no idea what, what, why, what makes me promoted? I don't know. As a junior faculty, you come in, you're like, I just want to work hard and be a good citizen. And be a good team player and help out my group. And I don't know if you feel the same way, but. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I had no idea until you, you helped us out, you know, a couple months ago. So. I think this has been really useful for junior faculty. Um, so I was going to. The other ask, thing I have to yeah. say, I learned <laughs> that in the promotion process, at least at the university of Chicago department of surgery, men live in the middle. The women are the least engaged and the most engaged. <laughs> it was really, it's striking how that dichotomy set up. We have some really engaged women, some really women who would prefer not to ever have to be promoted or look at it. And the men are all kind of much more down the middle. <laughs> That's interesting. We'll have to see how the second year comes through, whether it can, as a pattern that continues. Um. So just kind of along the lines of trying to help and what kind of tactics have you found to be effective at creating change? Being the squeakiest wheel all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably works against me as well, but um, I think just persistence with a lot of this, you know, um, just speaking up and making sure that that everyone is heard and, and represented at the table. Uh, I agree. I think there is something to being a squeaky wheel. Sometimes it's it does seem like you're annoying people to death, but I think it's it's important. And I think that you sometimes kind of just keep having to be the voice. When I think about you know what our panels and stuff look like at our meetings, I mean five years ago people were just hated my guts because I'd be like, oh, there's no woman. Excuse me, no woman. You know, like it felt like every meeting. And now it's finally other people are saying it. It was like, but someone had to start it. So I think. Those things are really uh, important. Um, you know, it's funny. We, I was just at the, it's the A-Way core curriculum sets the, it's like information that basically pretty much every residency program in the country is now using. It used to be called Campbell's Club from a textbook. And now it's core club because it comes from the data and the information that was putting together. 
and they were talking about our DEI group had met with our core group to talk about some stuff we could do to adjust. And at the very end there, we we're breaking up and talking about people turning over and who you might bring in, who you might want to promote. And I was like, there's only two women in the room. And I was like, Hey, you guys just remember, like, think about diversity when you're, cause as bright as they broke off, I was like the squeaky wheel, just like you, like, Hey, remember to think about diversity, think about women, think about promoting people you wouldn't necessarily think about. So I think it's important to have people at the table kind of raising their hand to do that too. Um, I was curious what changes, if you, if there's like one thing you could help with changing for women surgeons, what do you think would be the most beneficial things? I still worry a lot about, um, you know, the early years and, and women having children. I think it's just, I still think it's something that's keeping women out of surgery and that makes surgery really challenging. And so I think uh, better family supportive care, I think is still something that's so important uh, for us. And and I and I mean, I guess maybe I'm in, I've read uh, Parent Nation too many times. It's a societal issue. It's not yeah. just surgery. We just happen to be a group with a lot of, you know, work responsibility and a lot of um, unsurety, un, unsure hours and things like that, which really don't mm -hmm. go well with childcare. I think it's a huge stress for for young mothers and uh, and young fathers. And so I really wish we, we could do that better. And because I think that would, I think we I think we need to do it better for our trainees. You know, I think that's where I really yeah. would like to see that benefit. Uh, surgeons train for a long time, right through their childbearing years, and and we don't do a good job for our trainees. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I can just agree with that, and and just say that it starts early, right? So you mentioned with trainees and um, with pregnancy support. Um, I think that's probably for me personally the hardest time is not even having a newborn, but when you're actually pregnant and dealing with exposures in the OR and, um, you know, just trying to make it to all sorts of appointments, but still uh, work towards your promotion, it's uh, it's challenging. So just any sort of um, support. And um, as you mentioned, you know, the, ch the changes in parental leave, I think having it be uh, parental leave and not just maternity leave uh, is extremely important and having full support for both men and women in that period of time, I think is critical. The Dana, the book um, Jessica's referring to, Dana Suskin wrote it. It's called Parent Nation. It's incredible. And she showed this graph, there's this graph in it about the unhappiness index and or happiness index, I think. And basically it's like um, people who don't have children versus people who have children. And in a lot of countries, especially you can imagine Sc Scandinavian countries where there's a lot of support, it, it just goes down a little bit if you have kids. America's like at the bottom of the bottom. I mean, it is actually a little terrifying how unhappy people who have kids are when you, I mean, they're supposed to be these blessings and joy, but it's just so much stress. And in the United States, to her, part of her argument is we have this like, you're supposed to be able to do it yourself. Like I can do it myself, but no one can do it themselves. And so having the culture of helping each other is is kind of not part of our culture so she's arguing for how can people help and parents start supporting each other it's a really great book um i have ad self-advocacy stuff about because i don't want this just about what you can do for us i have advice in here but i'm going to pause because i think we're about at time for questions from the audience Um, I, um, there's a few questions on zoom that I'll ask and, um, but we're open for questions from the audience. Um, I did want to say about the AAMC data, cause I think that's relevant to all, obviously the department of surgery has access to it. The office of faculty affairs has it. So you can email the office of faculty affairs, the department of medicine, uh, women's committee also has it and shares it freely. Um, and you can download it for $40 off the AAMC website. So accessible to all. Um, are there any questions from the audience that we want to ask them? Otherwise, I'll read these questions from the from the chat. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of questions throughout. One of them came about the kind of asking for more money. And um, have we ever have you ever done any kind of have you ever mentored colleagues by conduct, conducting mock interviews? Or how do you give advice to younger faculty asking for promotion uh, for salary increases? I've heard of it, but I've never done it. 
Um, and I would encourage it. Uh, like I said, I think with any uncomfortable conversations, practicing them helps. So, right, if you don't feel comfortable asking for money, a mock interview would be a great thing. Yeah. And maybe we should think of that for our women's group. Yeah, we should do that. <laughs> Good. I love that. Um, there's one last question. Um, there's a few funny jokes about like old girls network. Like you were saying, like there, there's an old boys network, there's an old girls network, and there's one about the men and the women should all go to the spa together. <laughs> oh, I agree. That would be much more fun. <laughs> As opposed to the girls. Um, and then it, it was talking about the intersectionality. Like you were, there was, a, we were talking a lot about binary gender, but what about intersectionality and, um, and um, is there any data about, you know, women surgeons with, you know, partners that are not binary, but, you know, women partners or um, polyamorous relationships? Like, is there data or did you see data about that? There is not a lot of data. Um, there's not. Uh, surprisingly little. I will tell you, I remember, this is, uh, this is like I always say, like uh, one of my leadership uh uh, courses, which ended up being, they did two years after this little bit of a drunken walk home one night with one of my friends, there was a, we did a women's leadership, but it came out of the fact that we said, you know, why in our field are there no homosexual men? We have, you know, heterosexual men and there are a few homosexual women, but there, why are there none? And everyone was like, I don't know. This is like a drunken conversation, but it was really true. Like, and in 2023, I don't know any openly gay men in my field. We do know some openly gay women and they seem to have very good practices, but it's it's funny how that, that would be maybe a bias in the other direction within cardiothoracic surgery, but it's a little scary. So we've had a few good talks in this um, lecture series, um, but not from surgery. It's been from medicine. And, yeah, it's there is a, I found out about it last year. I think it's called the pink phony party i could be wrong i can't remember the name of it there is like a informal group like very informal it used to be incredibly hush hush is my understanding in urology um for um gay men and women essentially and they will go out they have this like party every year at the aua which i'm sure it's somewhere this year i don't know where it is it's, but um i think there it's becoming more comfortable for people to talk about it we've had a number of residents here um, and I think people, it's becoming more common and much more comfortable for people talking about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much, data. like, yeah, it's just such a small yeah. number on that data. But not ready to be a group yet, or at least not within my field. Like we have women in thoracic surgery, would yeah, you consider? Gee, I bet you could probably. You probably could? I bet you there's, I would, yeah, I would venture to guess. Mm -hmm. They have an informal group, which I'm, I'm feeling could probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we'll wrap up there and say thank you to our speakers. Um, and I, I, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. We'll ask the ethics fellows to come down to the front and have a more informal conversation with our speakers.